Hello, everyone. Oh, yeah, thank you for coming to my talk. And I'm super proud to uh, be selected and um, um, may speak at the Great Fox Days in Luxembourg for the very first time. Uh, it's really awesome. And this talk is all about Eclipse Microstream, the ultra fast Java Cloud native persistence for microservices and serverless apps. And uh, first of all, I have to change the title a little bit. And it's because uh, Microstream is now Eclipse Store. So it's now an Eclipse project. And so it's called Eclipse Store Ultra Fast Java Cloud Native um, Persistence for Microservices and Serverless Apps. So um, these days, AI is super popular. And uh, I guess there are also talks at uh, this conference. And uh, with AI, machine learning, and all of these modern applications like virtual reality um, or Internet of Things, um, big data and cloud, the amount of data will be explode. And um, in the future, there are three factors that are very critical for all of these modern applications. And uh, this is high performance, low data storage costs, and simple implementation. Yeah, imagine we have all these terminators and they are not fast enough. So uh, this would be very easy to win the war against the terminators, against the machines. Or um, imagine they have enough terminators, but um, cloud costs are skyrocketing, so we can only use 10 terminators. Uh, so it's not effective. Um, Simple implementation is also important. So don't, uh, don't be afraid of uh, AI, by the way. Uh, who of you uh, does something with AI already? Machine learning? No one so far? No problem. So first of all, I, I like to announce, um, as I mentioned already, uh, MicroStream is uh, now Eclipse Store. And MicroStream is uh, now divided into two projects into um, Eclipse Serializer, because the serialization is uh, the core of the, the framework. And then we have Eclipse Store, which is a persistence layer. And uh, so both uh, projects are now available um, in release number one, milestone release number one. And uh, the final release uh, will be available in, in some weeks. So the code is already on GitHub. Um, you can download it via Maven already. Uh, and with uh, Eclipse Store, you will be able to build the fastest applications um, that's possible with Java. And this is now possible with Eclipse Store and in combination with the great Java built to machine and other Java frameworks you are used to use. And this is a great, great news. And uh, Eclipse Store also becomes a standard similar to the JPA standard, but more for serverless functions, microservices, and modern applications. About my background, my name is Marcus. Um, I work for MicroStream, and I um, yeah, work with Java more than 20 years now. So we started with a web design software called XPage. Um, then we developed um, a Java development environment based on Java Swing. So this was our first um, big project. Um, and the goal was to build something like Visual Basic, but for Java to enable 4GL developers to migrate to Java very easily. Um, and we, have a, we had a great GUI builder. Everything was really simple to use. But um, the problem was, as soon as the users wanted to store data, everything became very complex and, f and, and slow through runtime. And it's because of the complexity of data storage in Java. Then some years later, we migrated everything to um, Eclipse, built a new GUI builder based on Vardin. So we had to rewrite the entire framework. We open sourced everything again. Um, and then we, uh, we used um, Hibernate as a persistence framework. 
Um, then we added caching uh, automatically and it was still too, too complicated. So we worked on the JPOS Hibernate tools for Eclipse. Uh, we, we tried to improve the JPOS Hibernate tools, uh, make it more simple and convenient to use and faster through runtime. And then we recognized um, there is a technical issue and we cannot fix it. So we can try to optimize it similar to the database vendors, so they, we can try to make it a little bit faster, maybe 5%, 10%, but there is a core issue and we cannot fix it. Nobody can fix it. And I will talk a little bit about these uh, issues. Um, uh, it's, it's very important for, for this talk um, that, we, that we talk about uh, these technical issues. And, and this leads us to um, Eclipse Store, which is a completely different approach of storing data and uh, it's more like a Java way. So this sounds a little bit strange, but um, we will see that is, uh, you will be f already familiar with this approach and you can use it from scratch. That's, uh, that's great because mostly when new technologies are coming up, yeah, you have to rethink everything, have to learn new, new stuff. And with Eclipse Store, it's different because you know already everything. You just have to use it. All right, so um, we, of course, um, um, member of the Eclipse, uh, Eclipse Foundation. Here is a, a screenshot of uh, Eclipse, um, this Eclipse development environment. You can still use it, of course, Rapid Clips. Um, by the way, it's already existing, but not. Um, it's, it's not part of the talk, just for the introduction. So database development with Java, why is this challenging? So of course we love Java and Java is a great language and um, we can do almost everything with Java. And uh, when I came to Java, my first stupid question was to Java developers, what actually is the difference between Java and JavaScript? Wow, that, that was really, uh, tough, but because um, they said, hey, um, just a moment, you can stop. You, you cannot compare Java with JavaScript. That's completely different. I, okay, what, what's different? Tell me. Yeah, it's object oriented and it's type safe. So this is very important for us and we love this. This is super important for us. Okay, type safety, um, object oriented. Um, clean code, everything is uh, very important for us. And then when we worked on the JBoss, JBoss Hibernate tools, um, using JPQL as a query language or other query languages, then I saw these SQL strings. So as soon as we store data, we leave this object-oriented way, we leave the Java way, and it's because Databases work fundamentally different. So then we use, when we use SQL strings, they are not type safe. Um, but of course there are um, query languages existing which are type safe. Uh, for instance, the JPA criteria API, you can use it. But when you have a look on the code, then it's more complex not not really great to maintain and so this might be the reason why nobody uses it in practice so and and also um with uh, the as soon as we use the the specific database functions then uh it's not covered by jpa it's not uh it's even not covered by the by the sql standard so that which means the database vendors do not care really for a database standard, for SQL standard, it's because they have their own uh, database specific uh, functions and they are great in, um, in uh, providing these functions, but there is no standard. So which means we have to use strings again, not type safe, um, heavy to test, not good testable, uh, no um, um, autocomplete, uh, support by the IDE, so and it's just for storing data. Then we have uh, now with microservices, 
new challenges with um, tra traditional databases. So um, with microservices, we should now uh, cut our monolithic applications into numbers of services. So um, mostly, if you have modules in your software, this might be a good starting point of cutting your monolith um, and um, creating new services, sometimes hundreds of services. Um, they should run in their own container, isolated, that you can test your services very easily, deploy it um, very easily, and run it on a container platform. So that's the strategy, that's um, the concept. And then we have some kind of rules in, in terms of microservices. One of these rules, for instance, is if you have a microservice that stores data, it should have its own database. Oh, wow. Um, does this mean we need now probably 50 databases or more than 100 databases, for instance? And, and each, each uh, microservice should be responsible for a specific, spe a specific um, use case or task. So, uh, so which means um, one service, for instance, deals with sensor data. Any Java, it's not a problem. So simple list, or we can use collections. Um, but which kind of database should we use for sensor data? Uh, probably time series is good suit. suit uh, it's very suited for um, sensor data. But please don't use a time series database for complex data. But we have obviously complex data in a big microservice application. Um, oh, there is a graph database. Graph databases are very suited for very complex data structure. So probably for your 10th or 20th uh, microservices, a graph database is suited. But if you need some mobile stuff or if you need um, if you have other use cases please do not use graph database probably document database would be more suited so which means um, with microservices you might be deal with many different databases because the databases are they provide their own database specific data structure or format so and this is the reason why now they tell us, yeah, okay, you have to use multiple databases for multiple use cases in your microservice um, application. This is very effortful, of course. You need no, much more know-how. Um, and uh, this is challenging. And then it is expensive, of course. And this uh, might be the reason why now the database vendors want to become multi-model. So the new SQL databases, they try to be a multi-model data, database for multi-model data structure. Then you can um, use only one database. Um, yeah, so it's your decision. There are a lot of databases on the market. Then there are um, many other technical questions. So this is what I, what I meant um, initially. Uh, there are technical question, um, challenges. We were not able to fix it. I've never met someone in, in the software industry that was able to fix this. This is very interesting. Um, so it's because in Java we have, of course, object-oriented programming language. Everything is an object. We have um, sometimes complex um, object graphs in the memory. We use um, yeah, of course, everything that's possible in Java, collections, something like that. Um, but as soon as we want to store our objects, and we, and we use a relational database, then this is not possible. Because storing Java objects as they are, storing in a relational database is not possible. Um, because the database is, works fundamentally different from Java, the model is completely incompatible so and we call this uh, impedance mismatches uh, the object model for instance much more granular than a relational model um, you can uh, you can search very easily uh, on an object graph this is not possible in in a relational model you need a query language you need um, sql for that 
um, you have uh, in an object model, there is no foreign key constraints. This is not needed. So no synthetic uh, ID of an object. This is not needed. So you have uh, they are related um, with their object IDs. So and, and data types, we have only some data types, primitive types in Java. But um, for instance, PostgreSQL has 40 or even more um, data types. So if you import your table uh, information um, and you want to generate your Hibernate classes, then you get a lot of errors because um, the tooling is not able to map the data types to your Java types. So lots of uh, uh, mismatches here and we have to solve this. Um, and of course it is solved, but it is linked to more complexity and uh, further challenges. What's about NoSQL databases? With NoSQL databases, we have now um, databases that work different from the relational model. Um, they have their own um, data formats and we have, for instance, column stores, uh, document-based uh, databases using JSON or XML. We have the graph databases. We have um, the old object-oriented databases time series, and now we have the vector databases for AI machine learning use cases. But they are all incompatible with the job object model. So we have the same issues here as well. Um, so we cannot store our Java object model as it is persistently on disk. It's not possible. Of course, it is fixed, obviously. So because we are able to store data in Java, right? So what, what we need is in between a, a mapping or a data conversion. And um, uh, for relational databases, of course, we have object relational mapping frameworks like Hibernate and the standard is JPA, uh, Jakarta Persistence API. Um, the problem with mapping or data conversion is um, you will have a latency. So you have this mapping and um, when you get data back from a database, you will not, not get back uh, Java objects. So which means um, the Java objects have to be generated through every single read and write. And this leads to, um, to latencies. It will double your query time mostly. And so this is super expensive. Um, and we can, can't, uh, we can solve this problem because the models are incompatible. Impedance mismatch, you can read about this in, on Wikipedia even. It's really um, easy to understand article. Um, through runtime, we have latencies and when we used Hibernate for our Java IDE, then um, our users uh, told us, uh, I'm sorry, but this is not usable for our use cases. It's too slow. Well, we were in trouble, so what should we do? Um, of course, let's add a cache. So caching will accelerate our database queries because um, we don't need a database query anymore. Uh, or query the database because, hey, the result set is already in a cache, so we can read data directly from a cache. And we expected, wow, now this will be game changer. This will be fast. But it was not. Why? Um, so we expected ex fetching data from the memory should take microseconds. Uh, mostly, um, it took milliseconds. And we were wondering, why? So, it's because it's memory. Well, um, Hibernate second level cache, for, for instance, um, serializes the objects in the cache. And uh, when you read data from the cache, it has to be deserialized. So, and serialization is slow. Um, and so we have here latency as well. So it was faster. So yeah, it was, uh, really much faster, but not as fast as we expected. And then we have more complexity because now we have a caching layer 
And then we have uh, challenges with cache configuration. So there are a lot of different cache strategies. Wow, this is really challenging for people who are not really familiar with cache configurations. So if you make some mistakes, your application will be super slow, slower than before. Um, who of you um, is developing distributed applications? Okay, so many applications, um, we see that the, the application nodes are distributed, so the load is distributed through multiple uh, instances. And when you use microservice or when you have a microservice architecture, then your microservice should be um, small, should run on a small machine instance. But if the load, the load goes up, it should be scalable horizontally. And as soon as it scales horizontally, that's great because we in the cloud, we should scale horizontally, but the complexity will explode because distributed systems are very complex. So for instance, um, if we change um, an object in one of our microservices and we store data in a database, then it's great because now the node the, the microservice node and the database are in sync. And the cache uh, is in sync with the database. But the problem is all the other services are not in sync with the database. So we have a, uh, so we have a um, data consistency issue here. But um, of course, we are developers. This is not a problem for us. There are different cache strategies. So. Just put your cache between your services and the database. We're in the cloud um, and just one node is single point of failure. So you should avoid this. We need another cache. Uh, we need another cluster. So um, we need a distributed cache. Who of you uses distributed caches? No one? Okay. So this is common architecture for big applications. Um, if you have more load on, on your application, if you have more load on your database, uh, then probably uh, one database node is not enough. And by the way, we, we are building microservices, right? And microservices means no monolithic application anymore. So smaller pieces, horizontally scalable. But what, what about the database server? It looks like, for me, it looks like a big monolith. So they, it cannot scale, it cannot cut the database into 100 pieces and scale it horizontally. It's one monolithic application in our microservice infrastructure. So probably this is not really a great fit, but we are used to use it. And so we have to use databases. There is no um, alternative. So if the load goes up, of course, we can scale the database also because, hey, we can uh, create a database cluster. We can start multiple machine nodes and run the database on multiple machines. Then we have scaling monolithic um, application in, in a storage layer. But this is absolutely common, um, of course. Um, when I meet customers, they are mostly absolutely convinced of their database. And we were also working with databases, of course, for, for 20 years. And, uh, but I was wondering, um, obviously, your database is still not fast enough um, because you use a, a searching cluster. Who of you uses a searching cluster like Elasticsearch? Okay, no one. So we can see this very often. It's because they say, yeah, our database is not fast enough. Um, so we, we need faster uh, uh, response time. So this is the reason why we use a, um, a searching server. Then we have a third, uh, a, a fourth um, cluster in our infrastructure and the complexity is exploding. And th this really, yeah, crazy, kind of like crazy, but 
it is common. And this might be the reason why the cloud costs are exploding. Of course, you run multiple cluster um, layers for just for storing data and managing data in your application. And um, here is an example. So if you, uh, if you, uh, if you would need 250 gigabyte um, database, um, and we would cho choose, for instance, uh, PostgreSQL uh, as, as a service at AWS, it costs, depending on a machine size, right, um, $8,800 annually. So, but it's only one database node, so we should be uh, high available, we should be scalable, so probably we need some more uh, replicas. If we uh, use two or three replicas, our price will, will double or triple. Um, if we need, let's say, six um, database replicas, then um, the price will skyrocket. So then we pay around $50,000 annually just for storing data. The good news is um, the cloud um, providers, they provide object data storages, so binary data storage. Uh, for example, AWS provides S3. Uh, who, who of you uses S3 or similar blob storage? So they, yeah, very popular. Um, 250 gigabyte S3 costs you only 70 bucks per year in comparison to 8,000 or 50,000, depending on the node. So more than 90% cheaper than any database as a service, and we do not talk about database licenses, we talk about PostgreSQL or MariaDB. Um, so this, and, and we need, of course, uh, for all of these clusters, we need a lot of um, computing power, so CPU power, we need memory in all of these um, cluster layers. So, uh, it, with microservices, mostly the DevOps teams, um, they have to save memory because memory is very expensive, right? So please do not use too much memory in your um, application nodes or in your microservice nodes. Um, but if you use a database server, nobody cares for memory. So you cannot run an Oracle database with, with probably with uh, one gigabyte memory. This will not really work. So we need a lot of memory in our database servers. And so and if we run multiple instances um, of our database and we look inside the database, we will see there are a lot of memory used. And if you use a distributed cache in, in addition to that, you have, of course, a distributed cache means you need memory. So you have a lot of memory uh, usage in, in the, the cluster layer in, in total. So in total, there are a lot of um, cloud resources needed. And, and this is a reason, of course, why the cloud costs are exploding. And uh, it's only the production system. So actually, we should have multiple systems. Of course, it's because we need a testing system. The testing system should be exactly the same system than the, pro uh, uh, than the production system. And the developers also need um, uh, actually exactly the same system. So this is not payable in practice. Um, but um, probably with Java, we can solve all of these issues. Hopefully. Um, so wh what about Java, actually? So we know about Java. Everything that is executed in memory is very fast, and it's because we have a great uh, just-in-time compiler. Um, and the JIT compiler, if it's hot, then uh, it accelerates your application tremendously. It's executed almost as fast as a C program because of a great JIT compiler. So we know with Java we can do everything in memory. We can use all data types. We can use we can deal with all data structure, and we have great performance. What about data types? What about um, the data model? Java, you can build your object model completely freely. Yeah, you can store sensor data in a simple list, but you can also deal with super complex data structure. You can build an object graph with uh, 
millions of, of nodes in your graph. You can have circular references. Everything is possible in Java. So you can deal with uh, JSON. So we have no limits in Java. And we have a great query language in Java. We have Java Streams API. Um, if you use Java Streams API, let's say you have 20, you have 20 terabyte memory size, and you have complex data in memory, a very complex object graph. You can search this object graph with Java Streams API in microseconds, and it means microseconds. When we talk about uh, the performance of a database, we talk about milliseconds, right? So microseconds versus milliseconds. It's factor 1,000. We are with Java factor 1,000x faster than a database query. And we have all tools for that. The only thing missing in Java is there is no native function to store data. That's actually crazy. We have everything. We can build an ERP system, machine learning, AI, so we can build the terminators, <laughs> but we cannot save data. Sorry for that. Uh, that's actually crazy, and it's because, yeah, of course, we have the databases. They are built to store data, obviously. It seems, it seems obviously, but on the other hand, it seems obviously that we sh should store um, data with Java because we can do everything with Java, so why not storing data with Java? It is possible, and the um, functional principle is existing since Java is existing. So there is an interesting um, uh, pattern, architectural pattern, it's called system prevalence. Um, there is also a very nice article at Wikipedia, and um, it says, um, build your application with your programming language, obviously with Java, uh, search, process data completely in memory, keep your data in memory, because memory is super fast. You will get out a very simple architecture uh, it will be fast enough, it will be easy to implement for you guys because you're Java, you are great in Java, so we have no issues. Um, and um, if you uh, have to store data persistently on disk, just create a snapshot of your system state, and that's it. A um, lot of uh, programmers told me, yeah, I had uh, pretty much the same idea, of course. So we, are, we all probably had this, this genius idea, but there are so many challenges because if you have 20 terabyte uh, memory, data in memory, you cannot create just a 20 terabyte snapshot. And uh, if you have to restart your application and load 20 terabyte in the memory, this is not fitting with microservices because this is not super fast. <laughs> um, so this might be the problem why this concept is not really popular in the in the in the Java community. Um, but it is used and um, mostly by what I have seen, mostly by banks, by banking companies, uh, fintech companies, and gaming companies, because they need. Um, um, in memory computing, they need um, the fastest possible performance. Um, and mostly they build their own system that is able to deal with all this um, um, complexity when you're not able to store the entire system state. So, um, and if you change your classes, so there are so many uh, further challenges. Um, the expectation was, when this article was written, the expectation was, Hey, come on, in 20 years, um, so memory will be so cheap, don't have con concerns about big memory machines. Um, but we all know memory is still very expensive. So, um, but with Eclipse Store, we have now solved all of these issues, or let's say almost all of these issues, because with software, there are always some issues. Um, but with Eclipse Store, we have solved m most of these uh, issues, and now you can use this functional principle in practice, and you don't have to be concerned about um, big memory size and uh, fast or slow startup time, um, trans trans transaction safety, uh, replication, something like that. So um, because of uh, most banking um, 
companies or gaming companies using this functional principle to build their own system individual, individually. But we have now built a framework that you guys can use it uh, very easily for your applications. And Eclipse Store in a nutshell is um, a, a Java native. Uh, we call it native because it's core Java. There is no other technology used, no alien technology like a database is. Uh, you have to wrap it, uh, build your object model around the database. That's uh, not the case here. So Java native, it stores your object graph as it is, it can deal with all object models. You can build your object model freely, build whatever you like in Java. Um, and the Eclipse store will be able to store your objects persistently on disk into any data storage. So you can choose your data storage target. Um, the simplest case is you can store it on disk in, in, in plain files. Uh, you can store it in, uh, uh, in um, binary data storages like uh, AWS S3. And we recommend to use these cloud binary data stores because they are super cheap. But on the other hand, they are fully managed. So with uh, plain files, yeah, you have to manage your plain files storage for yourself. But uh, the object storages are managed by the cloud providers. So this is cloud native. Uh, they care for uptime. They guarantee you uptime. You don't have to think about or have to be have to care for replication. So this is provided by the by the cloud vendors. They provide you um, even data center replication. Um, backups just for $70 per year for 250 gigabyte. That's super cheap. Um, of course, they um, are not so fast, but probably you, you won't need that um, the performance uh, when you access um, your data storage. If you need more performance, then use plain files, then it's um, the I.O. performance is almost as fast as, um, as your hard disk, uh, disk uh, drive. Vice versa, the engine allows you to load um, any object reference and allows you to load um, also individual subgraphs into the memory and restore the object graph in memory. But you, you, you don't have to load the entire system state and recreate it in the memory. You can only load data that are needed immediately by using lazy loading. So you can have a data storage that is, you have around, let's say, 500 gigabyte database, and you only have one gigabyte memory. This concept will work because you have lazy loading, just load data in, into memory you really need, um, and keep the hot data in memory. The great thing is you don't have to care for um, data types, data structure. You don't need uh, to implement serializable. You don't, there are no annotations. You can deal with pochos. Um, so that this is super easy to implement. And so it combines high speed of the JVM with, um, with the data storages provided by the cloud providers. Um, they are fully managed and they are cheap. Um, and everything is also transaction safe. Um, and everything else is uh, covered by the framework. It is open source. It is uh, production proven already. So it uh, was developed. So it started 10 years ago. And uh, it's uh, uh, already open source under EPL license. Um, and now uh, it's available on GitHub. Um, and you can download it, download it via Maven. Um, Eclipse Store is also part of uh, modern microservice frameworks. It's part of Halidon. So if you use Halidon as a, a very popular microservice framework for writing microservices in Java, um, you get um, Eclipse Store out of the box because it's a part of this framework. It's also a part of Micronaut. So if you use Micronaut, you have um, Eclipse Store um, as a part of Micronaut. Um, by the way, it's it's still MicroStream, but um, we will uh, renew the integrations. And in some weeks, we will get uh, new versions of these integrations. And then 
this is the reason why sometimes I talk about MicroStream and sometimes I talk about Eclipse Store um, because we have no final release yet. Um, just to avoid the, co the confusion. So it's part of uh, modern microservice frameworks that are, that are built for uh, writing microservices. And we have also um, integrations for Quarkus, for Springwood, um, Payara Micro. So you can use it with um, all popular microservice frameworks, of course. And it runs also on GraalVM native images. Um, so how, how does it work? So let's have a, a look inside the database. So here is our uh, standard architecture with um, yeah, the NAP or microservice, uh, we have uh, data conversion or we have um, hibernate in between and the local cache. And when we have a look, uh, look inside the database, this is very interesting because mostly we just send uh, a query to the database and database cares for the rest. But what actually is inside a database? Um, of course, um, database vendors provide you uh, sometimes even a query language of course, a query language it provides us um, a programming language sometimes, so PLSQL, for instance. Then you can write stored procedures, stored functions, so you can write your business logic um, and implement the business logic directly in the database. Who of you uses stored procedures? Okay. All the other people don't use stored procedures. Why not? I mean, uh, the database vendors, they put a lot of effort in developing um, programming language provided and you don't use it. Why? And it's because in Java, we don't like procedures, right? So we like object-oriented programming. So we can do it better with Java. So we are better than the, data, the databases. Ah, okay, that's interesting. Um, and of course, um, we have a database management system because it cares for everything. Oh, that's cool. So I can do what I what I want with the database. Um, actually, no. Um, you can do that because you you can uh, you can use uh, locking. But I guess in practice nobody uses uh, pessimistic locking anymore. So in Java we care for logging and locking. Um, so and we care for validation. Everything is covered by the business logic actually in Java. So because we don't use stored procedures and stored functions. Mm, okay, so probably a database management system is not mandatory for Java developers, probably, uh, because we also can care for concurrency, because we have everything in Java. Um, memory, ah, good, good hint, there is a lot of memory in the database. Um, and of course storage. So, but with Eclipse Store we replace Hibernate. We replace um, we replace uh, data conversion if you use a NoSQL database. We keep data in memory, the hot data in memory, because we keep our object. Um, so we have our heap. This is all. It is at the same time our cache, which means we don't need a local cache anymore. So we can skip it because of we have data in memory. We can query data in memory with Java Streams API. We don't need memory on a database anymore. And we don't need a database management system anymore. We have concurrency uh, handling in Java. We can uh, cover for locking and logging and everything in Java. The only thing we really need is storage. And we use a binary storage. This is what we need and with Eclipse Store. And the end result is a very slim architecture, very easy to use, and it is very fast. And I'd like to show you um, Performance demo. So um, you can see um, <laughs> performance demo. Here there are two applications running in parallel. 250 gigabyte um, databases are used. Um, one application is built um, obviously with um, Hibernate and EH cache. And by the way, it's running, it is a hot EH cache. We read data directly from EH cache. The other application is built with uh, core Java. Um, we use Java Streams API for searching object graph in memory. And for persistence, of course, we need, uh, we, we use in this case MicroStream um, 
or now Eclipse Store. And we can see um, some queries are sometimes 10 times faster, some, sometimes 100x uh, faster, but very often the queries are more than 1000x faster. And this is no magic. You can build this for your own because it's the power of the JVM. The great news, um, the, um, the, the performance will increase as soon as you use um, the latest Java version because the older Java versions, um, they were slower. Now the latest Java versions are much faster. So if you update the Java version, uh, your database application will be will become faster, sometimes 20, 30, 50 percent faster just by updating the Java version. That's great. So because now you can deliver updates and tell your customers hey, we put a lot of work in it, and now your application is faster. So <laughs> that's great. Um, and also with new Java concept like virtual, virtual threads, this will be great for us because. This will accelerate our applications by doing nothing. You get this um, performance increasing for free by the Java ecosystem. That's really cool. And you can also build distributed applications or microservices um, with Eclipse Store. And because we provide replication, so we are now able to um, to distribute an object graph through hundreds or even thousands of JVM instances by using replication. So your object graph gets replicated, um, which means yeah you can use um, small services with only one gigabyte or um, serverless functions uh, with only 512 megabyte um, memory, and you can distribute. The, the, the memory through uh, multiple JVM instances by using uh, replication. And uh, this is how the cluster works. Uh, this is the functional principle. So we have uh, multiple uh, reader nodes. We have one writer node. Uh, one node is responsible for distributing the stores through the cluster. And it's only responsible for distributing the stores. Um, and if it fails, then the cluster can restart um, a new writer node in uh, milliseconds. Um, the, um, the consistency um, strategy is um, eventual consistency. So it's, um, it's built for reading use cases um, so that you yeah, have uh, tremendous loads, you can create tremendous loads or handle tremendous loads um, with this um, cluster strategy. So uh, in total, in, in, in comparison, um, this means uh, if you have um, classic Java enterprise application um, architecture and structure, we just replace the JPA nodes uh, with Eclipse Store nodes, um, they are much more powerful. We use um, uh, binary data storage like S3, so we don't need a database cluster anymore. So we can skip the whole database cluster. We save a lot of money, a lot of machine uh, power, a lot of computing power. Data are already memory, as I mentioned. We replicate the object graph and keep data in memory so we don't need a distributed cache anymore. It is, uh, at the same time, it is already, a, works like a distributed cache. So even when we build distributed application or distributed services, we have a really slim architecture, easy to create, easy to use, very, uh, yeah, you save a lot of uh, uh, cloud costs and um, and then the question is, do we need more memory in our nodes? So this is uh, one of the most asked questions. Um, the answer is um, probably yes, um, because it works with uh, low memories, with small memory sizes, basically. But if you have more memory, please put more memory in your, in your nodes. And by the way, uh, since Netflix now uses monolithic applications anymore, 
it's popular again and we talk about uh, monolithic applications again so it becomes more popular in the future um, so don't be afraid of bigger machines so with uh, this cluster uh, infrastructure you, which runs on kubernetes um, you can scale your uh, you, you can scale your microservices or your applications uh, vertically or horizontally so you can you can use both and on top of this cluster solution we provide also a managed cloud service because um, <coughs> in installing deploying a cluster is still effortful even if you get if you get uh, the entire infrastructure out of the box but it's still effortful um, bec because you, you need um, Kubernetes know-how and um, DevOps uh, effort. With the managed cloud service, um, you can create a cluster, configure everything with some mouse clicks. You can de define plans, how you want to scale out your, your uh, services or scale in and when should they scale out, when should they scale in. Um, so this is very easy. So and you also can uh, use this concept if you have uh, serverless functions, stateless um, services, then you can run your stateless services or services written in different programming languages. This is a, co a Java uh, a, a conference. I guess .NET is very popular here <laughs> or Python, uh, obviously not. So if you like or your colleagues can write the services in c sharp and uh, get access to the eclipse store cluster if they want you can choose your storage target as i mentioned there are um, all major cloud binary blob stores are supported and also databases are supported so uh, it's because databases can store binary data so you can also use uh, mysql or postgresql uh, for persisting um, the binary data. And, and by the way, uh, Eclipse Store uses um, the Eclipse serializer for serializing and, uh, and, and the objects in, a, in this binary format. Um, and the, the format, of course, is open source um, because it's an Eclipse project. All right, um, it, it runs wherever Java runs. The only requirement is Java version 8. Um, it runs on GraalVM native images. Um, you can use it with all JVM languages, and it runs also on Android. Who of you uh, develops uh, Android apps? No one. OK. Um, what a pity. So <laughs> yeah, but um, if you have colleagues, say, uh, so sometimes you have projects where the customer needs some mobile apps, and so probably, and the backend is written in Java. So we have these cases, and then you can tell your colleagues, yeah, this framework is existing and runs on Android as well. It's, it's exactly the same framework. Um, and it can sync your data very easily to the back end you develop. So very easy to use. Um, here is a big picture. Um, so it becomes a standard. Um, the name Eclipse Persistence API is not confirmed already. So I have to be careful. But uh, Eclipse Store is confirmed. The version is available So um, already. It becomes then the reference implementation. It's pretty much the same with Jakarta Persistence API and Eclipse Link as a uh, reference implementation. And on top of that, you get the cluster. Um, and uh, it's not only persistence library, so um, there are some more components. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a persistence, it, it's the, the Eclipse serializes the core. Um, then it's a persistence framework for the JVM, persistence framework for Android. On top of that, we provide functions like lazy um, leg legacy type mapping. So it's because you change, you, we will change your classes all the time. So if you have class changes, don't worry about schema changes. So schema changes is always challenging with databases. With this concept, this is not. Uh, it's very easy. Just change your classes um, and uh, start your application. And if Microsoft uh, or Eclipse Store loads data into the memory, it compares the object with your class. If there are some changes, then it will save, uh, will, um, will um, 
fix this automatically with a, with a heuristic. So simple cases are you add fields, you rename fields or remove fields, um, change some types. This is easy for more complex uh, cha uh, changes. Then you can define a legacy type mapping and you can uh, migrate your data on the fly. So it, the framework touches the um, older objects only when you, when you we load it into the memory. You don't have to refactor the whole uh, data storage. So it's very important to mention. Um, it stores data appendedly on, uh, appended to, to the storage, which means you store an object, then it's, it, it's stored appended. If you call a store method a thousand times, you have a thousand new objects in your storage. So, and it's the same when we change objects, we store it then it stores the new object appended to the file storage. Um, so you can then keep your uh, the versions or you can let the garbage collector of the engine remove the older objects from the storage. So it's your decision, you can configure that. Database connectors, a REST interface. With REST you get access to the storage data. Uh, to the data in your storage. S uh, CSV import export, so data, data migration is super easy, no problem. Um, we have also uh, CSV export import for uh, machine learning uh, data. Um, backups and converters, so this, this everything is um, provided by Eclipse Store and um, you get all of this out of the box. All right. Um, you can check this out, um, as I mentioned. Uh, it's available on GitHub, download via Maven Central. It's um, an open source project, so you're invited to contribute. Um, Microsoft is the company behind um, this project, um, but we, we love to invite you to join the project as contributors. Um, so if you like it, download it um, and build the fastest applications on the planet. Uh, machine learning and AI is coming up in Java also, and we have the best programming language for that and in combination with the fast JVM and the uh, possibility to build distributed applications with, uh, with this ecosystem. This is awesome. And then we will overtake all the other guys from coming from Python or other programming languages soon. Thank you for joining my talk. If you have any questions, uh, feel free. We have uh, some minutes left. No questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure for me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So just uh, because you mentioned uh, you have the REST interface uh, yes. uh, available. Are you or do you not think of using a specific kind of uh, interface or protocol just being more faster than just uh, any other available, right? Like HTTP or, or something. Um, Theoretically, yeah. Um, because it's, it's super fast, but in this case, uh, maybe the request is can be the throughput for, for getting this whole. Uh, you mean uh, when you have access uh, to the data in memory, or do you mean access to the storage data? Yes, yes, yes. To the storage. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, currently, it's REST, um, and it's only for um, it, it's it's not built for runtime purposes. So it's only built for developers that you can have a look inside the storage data. Um, yeah. It, it's not. It isn't. Yeah. Sorry? Not for the real time tool. Right. So. That, it, and because of, please keep in mind, this is not a database server anymore. So you cannot look inside the storage and you see the data and you, you have the idea, ah, now I can query and search in this, inside the storage. I can change some data. This is, please do not change the storage data by your own. You will destroy the entire database and application. This is only for developers. And through runtime, the database is now in memory. So the object graph in memory is your database and get third-party applications access by providing interfaces. Uh, you can use REST, you can re GraphQL, build an interface, don't let third-party applications have access to the data storage. Then 
this is always a problem with uh, database servers. This is possible, but this is where the challenges are. So mostly, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day at Fox Days. Thanks.